Are you living the Delaware Beach lifestyle? You can't live at the beach and do nothing. This up-and-coming year-round area has lots to offer. Find out where to eat, play, and serve. Living the ultimate dream. Hey guys, today you're going to meet Henry Bennett uh, with Bennett's Orchard. Now, we are going back eight generations of owning farmland uh, in Delaware. And there's all sorts of things that I learned in this uh, podcast. But um, I think one of the biggest things is that, you know, everyone thinks of a peach and they think of Georgia. But actually, Delaware makes one of the best peaches out there. And we're actually the first ones in America to have it. So that was really cool. Uh, so today, guys, we're going to meet uh, Henry, and you're going to see the challenge of 20 peaches. I'm going to challenge anybody to try to try the 20 different variations of peaches this, this year. And um, I want to post pictures down below of uh, you eating that juicy peach. And here we go, guys. Henry Bennett uh, with Bennett's Orchards. All right. Welcome to the 302 Lifestyle Beach Podcast. Dylan and Daisy in the house, and uh, we have Henry Bennett here. Now, uh, this is uh, something that if you guys are living in the 302 area, you've had to have seen uh, Bennett Orchards or um, uh, different types of farming going on uh, in the grocery stores, and you see the Bennett name, and or driving past even um, in Frankfurt, you'll see their name, but uh, sixth generation uh, farmer right here. And I'm just really excited to dive into this. Uh, I got so many questions about, uh, local farming and stuff and, and peach picking and peach picking <laughs> and uh, all kinds of good stuff. So Henry, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and how, uh, how did you end up? And I guess we know how you ended up in the sixth generation, but, uh, <laughs> uh, tell me a little bit about your story. I know we talked a little bit in the beginning. Um, but how did you, uh, you get here? <laughs> Thanks, Dylan. Thanks, Dylan and Daisy, for having me on the podcast. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, yeah, I'm a sixth-generation farmer here in Frankfurt. Um, I grew up on the original Bennett Farmstead. Uh, we're actually the eighth generation to have grown up on this farm. Uh, the first two generations did uh, milling, like uh, water power grist mill, that the remnants are still on the farm. Um, and you know, growing up on a farm in Sussex County is, it's definitely a hard lifestyle. You know, I was hauling wood into the house to heat the house by wood stove while my friends were going to the movies. So when it comes time to, you know, look at colleges and things like that, most kids that grow up on a farm aren't saying, okay, I'm ready to go to college and then come right back to the farm. Uh, yeah. My idea was kind of the opposite. I said, you know what, I'm ready to go see the world. And uh, I got accepted into the University of San Diego and I attended college there. And then about my junior year, I realized that I don't want to be in finance. I don't think I want to live in Los Angeles or San Diego or San Francisco or Silicon Valley. And I realized that um, I could take what I learned from my international business and my Spanish majors, apply that to our family farm and come back here to Del Marva and make it happen and continue our agricultural legacy for the next generation so that they have the same opportunities that my brother and I have to be able to continue farming on the same uh, land that our ancestors always have. Wow, man, that's so cool. Uh, so the first thing out of my head is how in the world did you end up making it partially through college thinking that you were going to do anything other than the farm? So <laughs> am I thinking growing up, I would think that you'd be working, you'd be doing all this stuff, helping out. And so how'd that go? So you you're like, you know what? I want to do finance or whatever it was that you're into. Um, how did that look like getting out of high school thinking, you know, how, how did your parents deal with all that? <laughs> um, they were pretty accepting of whatever I wanted to do and said, you know, as long as you get good grades and, you know, you get accepted into a school and get a scholarship towards it, you can do anything you want. And they were very open with that. They never said you need wow. to come back to the farm at such and such age. And they kind of that allowed me to realize that, you know, the grass isn't greener on the other side. You know, everybody thinks of San Diego and California. It's, you know, a beautiful place to live, but knowing what I know now, I think uh, we don't, you can't really beat the beaches in Delaware. Um, and I kind of just realized that about halfway through college, realizing that my calling was to come back to the farm and continue uh, what we do. And we grow peaches and blueberries, which are 
both really cool crops and um, was able just to apply what I learned and make our business more efficient and, you know, more uh, profitable and run smoothly and kind of realize it, you have to go away sometimes to realize how good it is back home. That is true. You know, I, I actually grew up in California, in Northern California. So okay. you mentioned, you know, San Diego, um, Los Angeles, but I grew up in the San Francisco area. Oh, cool. Um, and then coming out here, it's actually, I mean, I love it. I love it out here. Um, I like the fact that I can go to like the farmer's markets and, and see you guys' produce out there. <laughs> That's kind of cool. She loves picking yeah. peaches <laughs> and you mentioned blueberries and stuff. Yeah. Now, I, on the other hand, hate it because <laughs> my mom, you know, my mom, uh, I grew up, uh, she was a florist and a landscaper. So it's like, I remember well, I have nightmares <laughs> of like being like, I don't know, my eight or nine or something. And she would have us out there picking fruit and you could get like 25 cents, like a basket or something. I forget how it worked out, but you would get money for picking these things. And it was just so little. I mean, I did it until I was a teenager and um, I would just remember the bugs and I'm like, how do people enjoy this? I love it. <laughs> I love going out there and picking it. Yeah. I think mainly for me, it's, it's eating the fruit while I'm picking it. <laughs> yeah. So, That's definitely part of the experience. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. wow. So, Okay, so you're, I'm, I'm just like imagining myself like growing up, I'm on a farm. So you were out there uh, with the big equipment and stuff, or do you guys have like employees that do that? Or is it basically your family is running the entire farm? How does that look like? Um, so right now, my brother, my dad and I run the farm. And we do have employees. Um, and, you know, we do have equipment and things like that. But what we do with orchards, with peaches and blueberries it's all done by hand. So all of the pruning is done by hand. All of the bushes are thinned, uh, pull weeds by hand. There's, we're not like a grain farmer where John Deere makes a machine that comes through and I run it through 25 acres of peaches and they're perfectly pruned. Every single cut on every single branch on every single tree is, needs to be very exact and precise. And we, uh, the type of agriculture we do is what we call precision agriculture. So it's very attention to detail on every single tree and every single blueberry bush that we have so that it creates the perfect scaffold and canopy to bear the perfect fruit. Um, so it's, um, it's definitely very labor intensive and you have to have a lot of attention to detail to be able to make sure that everything is set up the way that it needs to be in order to bear the finest possible peaches and blueberries. Wow, Henry, that is awesome. So I don't know if any, if I'm like this, there must be some other people listening that don't really understand the, the behind the scenes amount of work it takes to have like, you know, holding that peach in your hand at the grocery store yeah. or something. So knowing that about your guys is uh, that you do precision. Um, everything is exact. I, I can't even wrap my head around how that looks. So can you go describe like the seasons and maybe some people don't even know what pruning is. Um, and just kind of dive into like, what's the, when's your season start and how does it look like going from, I have a peach in my hand in the grocery store to, you yeah, know, how long does it take? Like from, from like how, how, planning. yeah. How does your year, um, look? Well, so, all right. So going, when you plant a peach tree, it's got to grow for three years until it produces fruit for our standards. So. Wow. You put that tree in the ground and you shape it and you want to have the perfect canopy so that each individual peach gets sunlight and room to grow and isn't crowded out or shaded out by certain branches or um, any other factors. And the same with blueberry bushes take three years to come in neck. And that what they say is my dad always said, you got to grow the tree before you grow the fruit. So it takes about three years to get that blueberry bush or the peach tree into production. So we do crop rotation. So we know that we have an orchard now that was planted in 07. It will be on its way out in three or four years. We have an orchard that was planted in 2020 that will be into production in 2023. Um, so that's kind of the logistic planning of it. Um, on a year to year basis, uh, we start pruning in about January and we pass through each time tree about four different times. We go through 
and make larger cuts and increasingly smaller and smaller cuts down to the detail printing so that, like we said, that tree wants what we call an open center. So you want every branch on that tree that has a peach, you want it to get sunlight, room to breathe, um, and you want it to get all of the nutrients that it requires. Um, a peach tree will put out a lot more fruit than you need. So we either can go through when there are blossoms and we take some of the blossoms off. However, you're under the threat of frost. So some years we don't do that. Like we didn't do that this year because a lot of nights we were looking at very cold temperatures that could reduce your blossoms in half. So what that does is about right now, what we're doing is hand thinning. So we're taking about 75% of the peaches off so that what is left is going to get 100% of the nutrients, have that space, that light, and that freedom to grow that we need. Um, and then we do the same thing with the blueberries. However, blueberries, you can't hand thin, so you just uh, make your thinning by pruning. So um, we pass through each blueberry bush and peach tree about four times uh, just to create that perfect architecture to bear perfect fruit. And that's... Um, we do have employees that we help, but it's also a very specialized process that's been passed down to me from my dad and our growing style. So um, there is definitely some uh, generational knowledge too that helps us in this process. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad that we can just divulge your family's <laughs> secrets. On a <laughs> no. So, okay. So let me recap in my own brain. So it takes three years for a blueberry or a peach uh, or a bush or a tree to produce fruit that is usable. Is that right? But at all. But up until then, you guys are rotating the, the fields, basically. So every year you have a different field producing fruit that will be usable, right? Yeah. So you, what you see is, say, this orchard has a 15-year life expectancy. We plant a new orchard at 12 year, a year 12 of that, for example, so that you're coming into full production in an orchard when you're leaving another block that has less production. Holy cow. And blueberries so are different because blueberries are about a 50 to 60 year lifespan for what they produce. Um, oh, so you can't even keep using the same tree forever. You got to completely redo an entire orchard. Wow. Yeah. And it's, that's part of our crop rotation strategy. Oh, okay. <laughs> and you also you, you don't want to you don't want to rip a peach orchard out, you know, out and then put them right back in. The, the land has to grow something else, so it doesn't harbor any um, kind of diseases or pathogens in the soil. So you kind of got to let it grow um, corn or cover crops or things like that for about ten years before you can go back and replant. So wow. we're constantly kind of moving around the farm to different blocks, and it's a process. It's a decades long process. It's not a year by year process. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, we were driving by a farm uh, a few weeks ago, and you were like, what are they doing here? And I, I knew that yeah. in my head that you have to, like, just rotate your different crops because one will take away nutrients and one will put it back into it, right? But you have to know which ones produce the nutrients you need, and that's been passed down to you guys to, to do that stuff. So. And that yeah. also explains why, um, like – a few years ago, like when I first moved here, when we first moved here, I went um, peach picking for the first time. And then like a few years later, I was like confused because I'm like, wait a minute, this wasn't where it was before. But it was the same farm. <laughs> yeah. so I was confused. So that explains it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's funny. And then, uh, okay. And then the really interesting part for me is that you get these trees within that time frame to um, – to be perfect, really. So you're trimming out or when you say trimming or pruning, you mean you're snipping and cutting different branches to regrow in different directions, right? In order to give that perfect blossom oh, yeah. where you have the center that doesn't have any fruit in it and it's all exposed to sunlight. So it's all evenly uh, producing. Is that? Exactly. And that's what we wow. call creating the canopy. Wow. So that's that is, yeah. yeah, very interesting. Now when I go to your farm, I can go, oh, I know how they do this. <laughs> yeah, and if you look, you can stand in the center of the tree and you should be able to look at all every branch in the yeah. center of the tree. The sunlight's doing the same thing. And that's very critical to peaches is that they're not shaded out. 
So what's unique about Delaware with all this? Now, um, is this a good area to be doing uh, blueberries and peaches? Or is this, do you guys have your own challenges with the Delaware crazy weather? <laughs> um, I mean, I think every farmer all across, anywhere in the world has their own challenges. Um, but the, the interesting fact about Delaware is that Delaware was the first place in North America to grow peaches. So it's kind of funny when somebody comes up to us at the farmer's market and they go, oh, we know peaches. We're from Georgia. And I just kind of laugh at them. And I go, well, that's funny because Delaware has been growing peaches since before Georgia was even a state. And they don't really have anything to say to that. But it's because we're uniquely situated on the mid-Atlantic. Um, we don't get too, too cold in the winter. We don't get too, too hot in the summer. We have very sandy soil. Peaches like very well-drained mm -hmm. sandy soil. Um, and it's they use a term for grape growing, they use the term the terroir, which is why champagne can only be produced in the champagne region in France. Uh, we have our certain terroir here but with uh, being six miles from the beach, we get salty sea breezes. It keeps it temperate. It makes it so it doesn't get super, super cold in the winter, it makes it so it might feel like in the summer, but it actually doesn't get really, really hot. So um, Delaware is one of the finest places in the world to grow peaches and also blueberries as well. And blueberries are actually native to this area. Uh, peaches were native to China, but the Spanish brought them to Delaware in the 1600s. So um, both of those crops were very well suited to our climate and our soil and our topography. Holy cow. So that's really cool. That's interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that. I thought, I actually thought Peaches were from Georgia. Yeah. yeah. And Justin Bieber didn't help us out this year either. So we, we got to talk to him a little bit. So he needs to get his peaches from Delaware. So you have like your farmer wars going on too about who, uh, who's better. Yeah. We, we'll, we'll let Justin slide on that one. He's got his hand. <laughs> yeah. So neat, man. So, okay. So what, uh, what time of year would be the, the best time to go to your farm and get a peach? Or, and then a blueberry. <laughs> yeah, so blueberry season starts first. It starts from anywhere from the beginning of June to the middle of June, depending on the year. And that season lasts about four to six weeks. Uh, and peaches are, I, I call it, it's pretty much your quintessential summer fruit. Peaches come in around 4th of July and they leave around Labor Day. Mm -hmm. So to be able to eat a peach that was picked that day from our farm on Delmarva, you know that you're in summer, it's definitely summer once the peaches begin. And then once they leave, it's back to school, you know? So yeah. um, it's your quintessential right. summer crop. Sounds good, guys. So now you know, go get your uh, your peach. In August, that's in right. August. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we, um, we only sell what we grow and we only open when, you know, the fields are very bountiful. So we have, uh, we update the status every day on our farm on our website about what farmer's market we're at with what type of peach or blueberry. And then we also put our current picking conditions. So we just ask that people check the website or call before they come out because we're not open every day. It's when we have the fruit to open for the pick your own. And you guys are in some local restaurants here too, right? I yeah. Uh, we, um, we're in a lot of restaurants all the way up and down the coast. Um, we have a lot of restaurant accounts too that, use our uh, fruit. Yeah. All right. So uh, just in case you guys are looking for that information, we're going to have the links down below guys where you can check out their website and um, uh, to see when it's a good time to go up there. And that's bennettorchards.com. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Um, and they also have a phone number we'll put down below guys. So you guys can check that out. Have you heard of float therapy? Holy cow, this is like the biggest secret in America. <laughs> I think the world. Famous people, athletes, all these people are doing f float therapy. And it's called Urban Float in Rehoboth. You can go to urbanfloat.com, uh, click on Rehoboth, and check out these guys. You're basically sitting on 1,200 pounds of Epsom salt. Everything just feels so amazing. And you're on this weightless, de-stressing um, pod for an hour. I love it. You get a discount uh, your first time. You can also uh, let them know that you're from 302 Lifestyle. Check them out, guys. Sponsored by Urban Float. Going back to the topic of about uh, this area and moving to different places. So uh, I've lived all over the country, and Daisy's from the West Coast. And I'm, I tell you, it's weird. Like when you first come here, 
you know, it's like, uh, you know, but once you start comparing it to other areas around the country, this really is like one of the best um, seasoned places where it doesn't get too cold, doesn't get too hot. And you kind of got it in between um, of each season going on. So with farming, has there, what, what's been like probably, I don't know, your most challenging uh, time talking about like weather and stuff like that? Has there been like a year where it was just the most horrible year ever? Was there like a one time? Uh, <laughs> was that like? Yeah. Um, yeah, so as a peach grower, peaches are one of the earliest crops to blossom in the spring. So once those blossoms are open, uh, fun fact on the side also, the peach blossom is the state flower of Delaware, going back to the rich history of peaches in Delaware. Um, <laughs> but once these peach blossom, peach, once the peach buds flower into a blossom, temperatures cannot get below 28 degrees. So if you get down to 26, you might have a 50% reduction. If you get down to 22, you might have a 95% reduction in crop loss. Um, there's been... I was born in 1990. We lost a crop that year and we lost a crop in 1991. And then about five years ago, we had a, about 15, 20% of a crop uh, just due to those spring frosts. So as a peach grower, anywhere that peaches are grown, um, you're, what we say is it all comes down to a few nights in March or April. So we are watching the weather like hawks. Um, and there are some frost prevention strategies that like last year where we see it's going to be maybe 26 degrees that night, we bring in a helicopter. And what that does is because of convection, hot air rises, cold air sinks. If you're looking about 30, 35, 40 feet in the air, it might be 38 degrees. Whereas down at ground level where the blossoms are about eye level, you're looking at maybe 24. That helicopter acts as almost a big ceiling fan and it's mixing all that air, mixing all that air bringing them together. So you're going to get a 29 and that's enough to save your crop. So we've, uh, that's wow. kind of one of the things we have in our back pocket. And we had to do that last year. Oh, okay. um, I was even thinking like this year, it's been crazy too. Good. Like we got, we had a couple of nights where it was like 29, 30, like if it had been one or two degrees less than, uh, and I mean, those are very sleepless nights and you're looking at, you know, your whole crops on the line those nights, but, um, that's why peach growing is not for the faint of heart. It's uh, wow. it, the spring is a very critical time for us and fruit development and advancing from that blossom stage to green fruit and eventually uh, ripe, beautiful peaches in July and August. So when you get these, uh, these beautiful fruits, is there ever like a cap where you're like, okay, we just have way too many or like, are there optional like, oh, now we can add this or do this or sell this. Like, do you have like different tiers of like types of fruit? What am I trying to say? Like what you can do with the fruit? <laughs> um, basically, we do farmer's markets, pick your own and restaurant sales, and we do some wholesale. Um, but um, we only sell what we grow. So we're limited to, you know, what our trees are producing. Um, and so we usually have them being that being you know, six, seven miles from Bethany, we usually have a market where as much as we can grow, people are usually interested in it. And that's just because of our rigorous quality control and the fact that we only sell what we grow. So what's out there is what's out there. Um, but another interesting thing is that we grow 20 different varieties of peaches. So a peach tree only produces for one week out of the year. So we have 20 different varieties to get us that two month season. So that variety of peaches that we're picking July 4th is not the same variety of peaches that we're picking in Labor Day. So that by having 20, 20 varieties, we harvest each one, you know, every five days or so they overlap. That gets us a two month season. And the same thing with the blueberries, we have six varieties of blueberries that are staggered. That's how we get a four to six week season. If we had one variety of blueberries, we'd have about a 10 week season. If we had one variety of peaches, we'd have about a week season. So oh, um, bridal flesh is really critical in getting a long season and also getting the varieties that are suited to our mid-Atlantic climate. Now, what are some of the differences between the varieties? Um, the main difference is when they come into season. So your peaches that, rag that ripen the 1st of August are not the same trees that ripen the 1st of July. Um, there are definitely flavor differences in our very, you know, a lot of our customers, they know that they wait for their favorite variety that year. They, you know, they get them all year, but when they really come down and stock up when their favorite, you know, heirloom variety or 
things like that. Um, we also grow one variety of white peaches and they're in for about a week. And we grow one variety of nectarines and they're in for about a week. So those are very highly coveted uh, yeah. local commodities that, you know, yeah. your diehards are on it and they're, you know, they're picking seven boxes of white peaches because there's only one week in the summer they can get oh that. Gosh. Yeah. <laughs> I like white peach and I like the nectarines too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, I think the nectarines are my favorite, but I, uh, like I said, we have one variety of nectarines and 20 of peaches. So I might be a little um, jaded from the peaches and the nectarines are a welcome change for me to eat in August, you know? Yeah. Cool, man. So, well, that was my next question is what's your favorite uh, one out of each one? <laughs> but yeah, like I would your blueberry, you have six. Is there a specific type that you like from that? Um, well, this year we have a new one called Top Shelf that's coming into development. And it, this is the third year of growing this variety. So <laughs> after working in this field for three years on this block, I'm really excited to try Top Shelf. Um, but I also enjoy Draper's, another good variety of ours. But um, I mean, any... I always tell people the best peach of the blueberry is the one that's right off the bush into your hand. Uh, we don't have any cold storage or refrigeration. So that's why we have to have those 20 varieties because some growers will have five varieties and then they use, they put it into cold storage and then pull it out of that. Whereas mm. you pick them that morning, put them on the truck and they're at the farmer's market that night. Uh, we don't do any cold storage or refrigeration and that's a fresher and sweeter product to the uh, consumer. And like I said, also, it, it, that's why we have so many varieties, so that we can pick a new variety every five days. Always have something fresh to harvest in summer. And what, uh, where are you guys? Which farmer's markets are you guys at? I know you're, are you, you're still in Bethany. Right? Yeah, we, um, we do eight a week in Delaware, and we do two a week in Maryland. Um, you can go to our, our farmer's market schedule is on our website, but we do um, Tuesday Rehoboth. There's an Ocean City market in Tuesday. We do... Sea Colony on Wednesday, and we're also at Crooked Hammock Brewery on Wednesday. Okay. Thursday, we're in Ocean City at the Gold Coast Mall. Friday, we're in Fenwick. Saturday, we're in Ocean City again, and we're in Lewis. And then on Sunday, we're in Bethany, Ocean City, and Berlin. Okay, yeah. So, and okay. all of these markets are producers only, so you have to grow what you sell. So, we're selling our peaches that we grow right next to somebody who's selling their corn that they grow. Uh, and in the end, the consumer wins because you're buying directly from Delmarva farmers who have been verified that they grow what they sell. Yeah. And it's going to be the freshest possible and the best tasting produce that you can get anywhere on the shore. And Bethany Farmer's Market just started, right? Or they started, they uh, started this weekend. That one starts in June, in like June, uh, okay. June 6th, I think. Um, Lewis and Rehoboth have already started. Um, and then most of them start around the first week in June, okay. kind of with the height of summer's bounty and the harvest of summer coming on. Right after Memorial, yeah. I, yeah. I hate, go ahead. What you, were you saying? Oh, uh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, I hate uh, diving into this part, but I'm curious. Did, were you guys affected by the COVID, of course, in some way? But uh, how, how did that go for you guys? Because you're kind of um, business. You know, I don't, I don't think there's a business owner that you asked that wasn't affected by COVID. Um, and we actually had to lobby with our state to kind of prove to them that farmers markets are essential. Um, a lot of wow. the people in Dover sat up there and they thought that farmers markets are like a bluegrass concert or something that people just hang out when in reality, farmers markets are a direct to consumer way to market agriculture. And as we've seen the food shortages all during COVID, um, farmers markets really showed their vital role in feeding the community directly from all of our farms. Um, so we did convince the state to open and there were, were, there were um, regulations like every other business. And um, it was, you know, dip, you had to wait in line, but I think consumers were just so happy to get fresh fruit directly from the person that grew it. And um, when you're going to a farmer's market, there's no extended supply chain. Our supply chain is we pick them in the morning, we put them in the truck and we go right to the market. Whereas if you're, so cool. if you're looking at um, grocery stores, produce stands, all those produce auctions, they're buying produce from all across the country. So it's picked in California, put on a truck in California, driven across the country. Um, there's a lot of variability in that. And that led to a lot of the food shortages that we saw. So our small direct to consumer 
farms, I think, played a very large role in securing a food supply for consumers last summer. So despite the restrictions, people were still willing to wait in line and, um, you know, observe capacity restrictions, masks and all that, because they knew that this is the safest and the best and the freshest fruit and vegetables that you're able to get. Yeah. Um, and I, I actually went <laughs> to your orchard or peach orchard um, last year with a mask on um, <laughs> with, my little, with my friend's little son. And, you know, I'm like, I'm going, I'm going to get, I'm going to get my peaches. I'm going. And <laughs> it was so hot. It was probably the hottest uh, day of the summer, <laughs> like 92 or something. I'm like, I'm going to die in here, but I got my peaches. <laughs> like, awesome. I got them. <laughs> So, so, yeah. but um, oh, man, um, so I can probably go on or a lot about these different topics with this. Uh, one of the biggest things I, I think I, I'm getting excited about is I'm like a huge Netflix person, like where I watch like all these shows on like the food and like you know the crazy behind the scenes stuff with like these big box um, you know suppliers and stuff. But I think. And I'm interested to hear your take on this, but I'm seeing like a trend of this, of uh, really the population like desiring and craving like real food by like real farmers and like, yeah. you know, and cut out all that, you know, junk and all that stuff. Do you, how have you seen a, um, your life in the past, I don't know, five years? Uh, have you seen a shift in that, um, in that space? Definitely. And like I, like we had just previously discussed with COVID, when you were seeing these supply chains interrupted, um, people were realizing that, okay, these small scale family farms, direct consumers don't have to rely on a trucking company. We don't have to rely on a packing house. We are as fresh as it gets direct to the consumer. So uh, on a food secure, domestic food security standpoint, uh, we're probably about as resilient as it gets just due to the shortness of our supply chain. And then also I said, like you said, with Netflix and um, more and more people are interested in this topic now as they should be, because for so long, no one really knew anything about farming and they didn't know how, if, you know, if how, how our farm growing 50 acres of peaches was different from um, say a farm in South Carolina growing 2,500 acres of peaches, mm -hmm. but on a small scale, we're able to grow more sustainably. Like I said, I've, I've seen every peach tree that we have this year, at least two times. Um, we know what pests are out there. We do mating disruption, um, which is we set out pheromone lures to disrupt mating practices of insects so that they don't reproduce. And that's so you don't have to use harmful insecticides. Wow. Um, whereas these large scale commercial farms are all worried about their profit margins. So they're gonna do whatever's cheapest and we're going to do whatever is best for our consumers, for ourselves, and for our farmstead, because our philosophy is that we've been here for eight generations. We've been farming for six. We want to leave our farm in a pristine habitat for the next six generations. And if we tried to do the same farming practices as these large-scale factory farms, our farm wouldn't persist for future generations. Oh, I, I was watching a movie one time about um, back in the day, like, you know, the big box people are going around and like almost forcing farmers to use like their seeds or like all kinds of like craziness going on with that stuff. Um, have you had any issues with that or have you guys had, you know, basically have stuck with your system and not have any outside influence or problems with that? Um, yeah, a lot of that you see in a lot of the large commodities like corn and soy and things like that. Um, but Peaches and blueberries are not actually genetically modified. They haven't synthetically mapped the chromosomes. So there's no such thing as wow. a GMO peach or a GMO okay. blueberry. So when somebody comes up to you at the farmer's market and asks, are these peaches GMO? You first know that they haven't done the research because that's an oxymoron. There's no such thing. That's cool to know. Um, but we, like I said, we've been, we've had decades of data. So we know what varieties and all suit this area. And, um, we rely on past experience and things like that instead of kind of trying to remap the wheel or try to go uh, yeah, yeah. out or something that presents its own set of problems. Now, is your dad like retired now or are you pretty much uh, uh, a I mean, whole family practice? I mean, you guys yeah, I mean, we're all out here every day. Uh, I don't, I don't think they, uh, 
I don't think farmers ever retire. <laughs> uh, you know, but uh, he's out. He's got one hand on the reins and one hand off. I guess we'll say that. <laughs> but so uh, what's um, Henry? What's been one of your biggest mistakes um, as a farmer or uh, someone in in farming industry? Um. I mean, like you said, if it, what they say is uh, hindsight's 50-50. So, you know, a lot of nights you don't get a helicopter and you wish you did or um, you wish you had done this differently. I mean, there's decisions like that every day you could rack your brain over. But I would always try to say we need to look forward and we need a forward-based approach because we can't fix any problems. But we do just need to say, okay, um, we need to do mortar mating disruption for this pest this year because they caused some economic damage last year. So, um I wouldn't say there's one huge mistake, but it's just a collection of little ones that gain your knowledge and your experience so that you don't have this in the future. And there's always something being thrown at you. And I learned something new multiple times a day on this job. Um, but that's what knowledge is based on experience. So uh, try to get as much experience as you can. Yeah. Uh, Henry, what's, what's one, one of the biggest things that you think people don't know about farming i know you mentioned a couple of things but um um i think just people kind of are confused about where their food comes from yeah. and i think that that's where we're going to a farmer's market especially a producer's only one where everyone must sell what they grow i think that's your best way to get fruit and vegetables directly from the consumer and it's you know part of our job in the summer is it to be an educator you know, we're telling people when the blueberry season is like we just did or that there's 20 different varieties of peaches or yeah. we bring a, a little blueberry plant, you know, a potted one to the market. And I got, I've gotten people to ask me if it's a lime tree. So, <laughs> um, like I said, part of our job is teaching people where their food comes from, what's in season and where to buy it from. And uh, that's where direct to consumer agriculture and farmers markets are the best avenue to get out the message as well as get people fruit and vegetables the quickest and freshest way possible. Okay. And, and you guys actually, like, I, I, sh I haven't gone to a farmer's market as much as I'd like to. Um, I try to go every season, um, at least once or twice, you know, during the season. But what I like to do when I go is I actually talk to the people there and, and you know, I, I try to find out what, where those stuff comes from and, and how they grow it and all that. And you guys are always happy to like talk to everybody. Sometimes I'm like so waiting there, like, I want to ask a question too, but like, yeah. <laughs> you know, but that's good though, you know, cause that's why people go there. I think and they want to find out where they're getting their food. You know? Yeah, exactly. And, um, yeah. and not only is it educational, it's the freshest possible way to, to buy fruit and vegetables. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I, I think there's a big shift and not, not only like fruits and vegetables and stuff, but I think same thing with, uh, you know, um, uh, meat and, other types of food. I think everyone's really wanting fresher, better, mm -hmm. uh, more quality rather than worrying about cost. Yeah. And, so, and like, uh, loving it. You guys do that. Once, once you taste like a peach, you know, in July from here, you can never go back to a peach in the grocery store <laughs> or, or that was, you know, from somewhere else. It's just, there's no comparison. And a lot of that, that is, that the is lack, so of, true. lack of refrigeration too, you know, mm. Um, which we never refrigerate any of our fruits and that makes a big difference in the freshness and um, everything. I wrap my head around actually, like um, having that much fruit and like zero freezing or refrigeration, let's get this out. <laughs> you know? It's hard. It's not easy. And there's a reason that we are like the anomaly, you know, every other peach grower that I know all across the country has refrigeration. They look at us like we're crazy, but at the end of the day, you know, when, um, so I've, you know, I've spent 60 hours a week all spring getting that crop ready and you give a peach to somebody that's never had one right off the tree and they can't even get words out because the juice is dripping down yeah. their head and they're like, Ooh, this is the best thing I've ever had. It's like instant gratification. You're yeah. like, all of those hours were worth it. This is why I do this. This is why I love my job. And I joke around with, you know, our account and I say, does anybody ever go up to you and say that's the best tax return I've ever I've ever seen? And he's like, no, no. I was like, well, that's why I guess I'll still be a peach farmer because all of those hours in the field are instantly justified when somebody says this is the best thing I've eaten all summer. And there's a lot of good stuff to eat at the beach, so yeah. uh, that's instant job satisfaction for us. 
That was actually my next question is what's uh, your favorite thing about <laughs> doing that? So that's really cool. Yeah, I think that that's definitely my favorite thing is the, uh, the gratitude that people have. Uh, Henry, living in the and growing up in the 302 area, do you have any favorite spots um, that you like to visit? Um, hang, out. hang out. I I'm an avid surfer, so whenever you know, obviously this time of year I don't get to as much, but uh, if I can, that's one of my favorite things to do is surf. Um, you know, we'll go. Every time to- somebody tells me they're a surfer out here, I'm like, where do you surf? Like, <laughs> I feel like the waves don't get big enough. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, a lot of you know when it's cold in the winter, that's when it's mm-hmm. good, things like that. But uh, that's one of my okay. favorite things to do, and in, in my spare time is go surfing. Keeps me right, We're about to uh, to get into the lightning round here, but um, I have a question. How if I'm picking up a bag of blueberries or some peaches how do i know that it's the best time to buy that or how do i know obviously when it's ripe is is i'm picking it off the tree and i'm eating it but if i don't know and i'm in a store um or at a farmer's market or whatever um which which one should i be picking up like how do i know which one's the best uh, blueberry or peach um i think the first thing would be to find out what's in season and be aware of like, you know, like asparagus and strawberry are in season right now. So that's what you're going to look for. And um, the second thing would be to go to farmer's markets and make sure that they're producers only, because then they verify that the people in those markets sell what they grow and it's only available in season. So that's probably the most um, important aspect is to make sure that you're going to a producer's only farmer's market because you can be guaranteed that you're buying it directly from the person who grew it. And for that reason, we only attend producers only farmers markets. So mm-hmm. you look at our farmers market schedules, all of those are producers only. Um, so I would say that is your best bet on that. And then uh, you can look up availability charts. The Department of Agriculture has those and it shows you kind of what's in season. Like you're not going to be able to go anywhere and get sweet corn right now. So if you go to anywhere, you know, there's no local sweet corn right now. So that should be your red flag. So just kind of knowing the seasons knowing when things are available right. and buying it from the person who grew it. Uh, those are the most important things. That's good to know. Yeah. And, and on your website, you guys have uh, the, the different types of peaches and blueberries that you guys carry and when to get that um, at your orchard, right? That's all on your website. Yeah. Yep. It's all on the website. All of our varieties are there as well as our farmer's market schedule and pick your own information. It's all updated on there. I didn't even know about the different varieties. I mean, I obviously I knew, but uh i didn't know that you guys had that many there so now i'm actually i might actually uh get excited about he won't they're... go out there it's too hot for him. <laughs> i'm like all right just pick them all and bring just, them back to me just bring me <laughs> that's, a box yeah. <laughs> that's kind of part of the fun too i think is everybody wants to come back and they get a different variety every week so mm-hmm. say if you visit us and you know sea colony on wednesday the next wednesday we're gonna have a different variety we're gonna have a different one after that and um it kind of adds to the allure of it you know and but like we said the education and um, everybody has their own favorite, but at the end, I think the one that's in season is the best one. Maybe we'll do a little competition to see, um, to try each, peach. each variation <laughs> of peach yeah. this year and do a one a week or something. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, sounds good, man. So lightning round. So, uh, what is your best book, tool, software, or video just one thing that stood out in your life that has helped you in some way and uh, why is it so great? Okay. Um, sorry. It's <laughs> um, like just one thing or video, movie, book, uh, something that has really helped you in your life or has been like a, a kind of shift in your life. Um, I think when I was like seven or eight, I picked up a trans world surf magazine and I was like, oh, this is awesome. And then, you know, I was like, wait, we have an ocean. And like, once you start surfing, once you stand up on that first wave, you're hooked for life. So uh, I'd say but maybe surfing is probably one of the reasons why you went to San Diego, right? There you go. It is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. So um, it, you know, that definitely get learning about surfing and starting surfing at a young age has shaped me to be who I am. And, um, wow. This is going off for the peaches. And blueberries, but uh, what are the the best spots to go surfing around here? What's the best time of year to do that? Um, uh, the best time of the year is what most people wouldn't think would be the best time of the year is the winter because that's when we have the storms and waves are generated by 
wind and water. So when we have those big nor'easters, that's when the surf is best. It's also the coldest, but it's the best. Now, when you have on that full body suit, does that keep you warm? Yeah, it does. And wetsuit technology now compared to what it was when I was growing up is a lot better. So Mm. um, I think it's a lot easier to winter surf now than it was maybe 20 years ago. Hmm. What's the best, uh, I mean, you go down by Indian river bridge. Is that. Yeah. The inlet or, uh, acid is always good. And then, you know, up to Cape Henlopen, but, uh, it all varies. So, um, it kind of just depends on what the sandbars are doing that time of year and what the, where's this, where the sand's moving. Mm-hmm. All right. Henry, what is your favorite, uh, dish served with peaches and or blueberries? Like what's your favorite thing made from one of those? Uh, peach margarita, hands down. <laughs> peach margarita. I never even heard of no, that. No, but you know what I love <laughs> is and at our harvest, they have that peach dessert. Oh, uh, that's famous. Yeah. Yeah. That's from that you guys, good. right? Yeah, it is. It's just called yeah. Peach Feast. And they do like the mascarpone down with the peaches on top. Oh, yeah. Do you know what yeah. I'm talking Oh, yeah. About? yeah. I remember. That's one of my favorite things. Holy yeah. cow. <laughs> I didn't know that was from you guys. Because I, I was thinking about it. I was like, the only their thing. Shirt, that, their shirt. They um, have their names on their shirt. That's why I was. The only thing that's ever like, like when, as soon as it came out of my mouth, I thought of them. I was like, no, I don't think it's these guys though, but yeah, it has to be. So. No, it's, yeah, I drop, we drop them off every day and they're all, yeah. you know, they're picked that morning and they're on that peach feast that night. So, so that's who a makes great the peach show. margarita. Where do you get those at? Uh, you just got to come over. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have them there? Uh, <laughs> no, just. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Right. Um, <laughs> no, I just, it, you know, it's something nice and light and refreshing in the summer, especially if you leave the skin on and blend the peach in with the margarita, you get flecks of that zest mm-hmm. um, so it's it's something really good so you just throw the peach in with the blender uh, yeah you can hit it and then put peach in lime juice um yeah. and whatever you know whatever else and blend it all together and it's pretty good after. daisy's drinking uh, later yeah <laughs> <laughs> pretty good no peaches yet. <laughs> an hour day in the yeah, not yet. Yeah. But, uh, uh, all right and here we go what's one question i should have asked you and what's your answer <laughs> Um, one question you should have asked me was, hmm, maybe what is, what's one of the biggest challenges to agriculture in Sussex County? And I think we did discuss that, but, um, we touched on it, but yeah, I didn't get into that. I think that in my lifetime, there's been three road projects through this farm that we've had to fight. So I think it's just trying to be road road projects. Yeah. It's, it's trying to. Because when they look to draw a new road and everything around us is built up and they see 250 acres of farmland, it's like, oh, great. This is perfect. We'll just cut right through this farm. So that's one of the biggest challenges. And uh, the Delaware Department of Transportation is actually a threat to farmers. Um, A lot of people don't realize that. And they kind of indiscriminately target farmland to get roads to development. And it's it's very frustrating. And we're trying to blew my mind right now. It's not even something that I even thought about. Well, I've been thinking about roads, like yeah. where's all this traffic going to go, but I never thought about farmers. Uh, and that's the problem is they don't do any forethought. And they don't do any planning with developments. The developers develop, make these developments and then they're gone and it's left to taxpayers to shoulder the burden. And the first thing they target is farmland. Wow. wow. So if somebody wanted to support that or um, had some type of influence with that, uh, where would they go to want to help? Um, I would just say contact your local legislators and just let them know that um, farmland is should not be the first thing targeted for road projects to support development because we're trying to do continue our legacy and keep farming. We're not selling our farm to be developed, so yeah. why should we pay the price for development in Sussex County? That's true. Now, are you guys, do you guys try to keep continuing to acquire more land, or are you pretty much capped out by everyone else trying to develop? Um, we're pretty much capped out. Um, we, I don't think we've gotten more land in two generations. So, <laughs> um, we're pretty much capped out and that's where, you know, we just keep the crop rotation and things like that. And our strategy, like we discussed, we've got a bit. good proven system. And yeah. Then. But it's not like we can, it's not like they can cut a road through your farm and then we can go buy farmland elsewhere. It's not exactly not. Right. not. Yeah. 
Sounds good, man. Well, I hope to uh, be able to support you guys in any way. I know I'll definitely be doing the 20 peach challenge, I guess, this year. <laughs> I'm going to post that on here and see if I get anyone else to do it. He's going to awesome. make me go pick it. Yeah. And then he's going to bring it over here. <laughs> there you go. Or go down to the, the farmer's market. Farmer's market yeah. You know. yeah. Uh, Henry, man, it has been such a blast and an honor to have you on. Um, I think I've learned more this past half hour about peaches and blueberries and I've, I've never known i think i'm gonna even enjoy it more now yeah yeah, definitely. yeah. I, didn't, I didn't realize they took that long to get that yeah. perfect you know peach i can yeah, think peach, but actually blueberries too i just don't like picking blueberries because it's, it's too low yeah <laughs> definitely a little more labor intensive but we grow high bush blueberries so they're actually about high level so when they're fully mature, established plants, it's not too bad. It's cool. you're not bending over like you would be strawberry picking or anything like that. Cool. Is there is there anything else? I know you said you rotate in different crops. Is there anything that you guys sell um, outside of peaches and blueberries? I think you mentioned corn. No, we uh we will like we will rent. You know, we'll take a field and our cousin will will plow that field and put and plant corn in it for just to crop rotation, just to keep the land in production because you don't mm -hmm. want to just let like they say let something go fallow um you want to keep them in production you know to keep the soil stimulated and a different crop that takes different nutrients from the soil than the previous crop that was grown there yeah cool. all right well cool man uh definitely thank you for being on henry uh this was a lot of fun and um it was really yeah really cool to learn about all this yeah thank you guys for having me it was a pleasure to be on here and uh it was great to be able to do this in the beginning of summer and uh, make sure when you come pick your own or at the farmer's market, you ask for us and we'll uh, see you guys. We'll, you'll, you'll see what we were talking about this show. Yeah. yeah we'll do <laughs> and, we'll and have to do a, a live edition from, uh, from your spot or uh, one of the yeah, markets. Yeah, we do that. Yeah. Get you guys on there. And I'm going to actually post that, I think, uh, 20 Peach Challenge to see if anyone else can uh, join me on that to see if you okay. can get 20 different peaches this year. Yeah. And, uh, and Henry, um, so we will drop all of this down below guys. Uh, if you guys are looking to, uh, look at their schedules or, um, get any of the information that was mentioned here, uh, we'll put the website and uh, phone number down below and keep living the three or two lifestyle guys. Did you know that not only was this the first state, but this was the first state to have a peach. <laughs> so that's really cool. Yeah. Um, but all right guys, uh, keep living that three or two lifestyle and, uh, we'll see you next time.